Welcome to Garden Delights. I'm Susan Howington, Family Consumer Science Agent with the Henry County Cooperative Extension, partnership with the University of Georgia. Today we're going to talk about corn and I have a good recipe that I think you're going to like and we're going to hear from Frank Hancock, our Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent. He's going to talk a little bit more about those tomatoes and how to graft those tomatoes and hopefully this will be something you might want to try to see if they will grow. So we'll see you back in just a little bit on Garden Delights. talk about corn today and you'll hear from Frank and he's going to talk more about those tomatoes and how to graft some tomatoes but today we want to tell you about a little bit about corn and we're going to talk a little bit about how to put a great little baked corn casserole together and hopefully you're going to like it but let's talk about this corn and how nutrition it is for you um, Corn, I love corn. I look forward to it coming in every year. Um, I remember growing up, picking many ears of corn growing up and, and cutting it off the ears. I didn't do it, my parents did. And I remember helping my mother cook it um, and get it ready to freeze. And so I can tell you, it's nothing better than taking corn out of your freezer later on in the winter and eating some fresh corn. So let's talk about what's so nutritious about this corn. It is fat free. It's what we put on it is what makes it not so fat free. But it is saturated fat free and it is low in sodium and cholesterol. It also is very good source of vitamin C. So if you're gonna eat corn, you're gonna get a good source of vitamin C. And then fresh corn also has carbohydrates and it also has fiber. So when you're eating your kernels of that corn, you are gonna get some fiber from it. Calorie wise, about five inches, and this is about a five inch ear of corn, you're gonna get about 70 calories from, a, from an ear of corn. So that's what you're looking for if you're trying to figure out about your calories. So if you eat this whole ear of corn here, you would have around 70 calories. Now selection, when you're looking for corn, if you're picking your own corn, you grow your own corn, then you'll kind of know what to look for. But you want ears that are fresh looking, that have good green color to them. You're gonna be looking at the silk part of it to make sure it's moist too. Um, when we're, you know, selecting at the grocery store, uh, you see people and it's okay for you to do the same thing. You want to find really good green ear corns, but also if you feel the temptation, and sometimes I do, you can take your hands and run it through the corn, um, the, the shuck part, and you can kind of feel if it's spilled out as far as the ears of corn in the kernel part of it. Some people need to see it, and sometimes I'm the one of those folks that need to see it. So you'll see them in the grocery store even actually taking the ear of corn, and they're going to break it back just to make sure they see the kernels. And what you want to do, because you want to, if you're going to buy your ear of corn, you want to make sure you have kernels all through it because you don't want to buy a half kernel uh, ear of corn. Um, and then also you're going to be looking for decay. You don't want to see any kind of decay. You don't want to see any kind of worms that's been eating on the corn. And a lot of times when you break it back and look at it, that's when you can see if it's any kind of worm damage to it. So those are things you want to do to look at it. And also when you're buying at the grocery store, if it looks dry, it doesn't look moist, um, you don't want to buy it because more than likely it's been sitting there too long and someone's, someone hasn't put it where it needs to go and we're going to talk more about that storage part of it. But just to keep that in mind, um, a ear, a ear, two ears of corn, like these two ears right here, you can get about uh, two cups of kernels when you're cutting it off. So if you're looking about how many it takes to get that, about a cup is what you're going to get from two ears. Um, and so you want to look at those when you do it, but for storing, Corn needs to go as soon as you get it into the refrigerator. So once they have it in the stores, hopefully it's a it's cool, it's been refrigerated or it's kept cool. If you're picking it, it needs to be kept in the refrigerator as soon as possible. We say about one to two days um, in the refrigerator and hopefully by then you're eating your corn. If not, like I said, corn freezes very well and you also can can corn. Um, and if you wanna learn how to do that, please call our office and we have a wonderful So Easy to Preserve book that will tell you how to can or freeze that corn and how to do it correctly. So keep that in mind. Um, we wanna make sure that we get this corn in the refrigerator because once harvested, the corn will, the, the sugar in that corn, the natural sugar, it will rapidly turn to starch and we don't want that. So we wanna make sure we keep it in the refrigerator and then we also have a plan in that one or two days, that plan of what you're gonna do with that corn. Either you're gonna eat it or you're gonna store it. So make sure you keep that in mind too. So as you can see, 
corn is a wonderful thing to have and eat. Um, it'll be coming in very soon. You'll see different stages of it coming in. Make sure you're buying it right when it comes in because once corn comes in, it's gonna be gone for the next year. So I will tell you, look around. There's a lot of pick your own places that you can get fresh corn. Um, there's different varieties of corn too that may be you're suitable for you. Um, so just remember that corn is something you wanna look for very soon and hopefully you're going to put it into your family meal. So as you can see, corn is a wonderful thing to have. It's great in vitamin C. So when we come back, we're gonna talk more about how to put that baked corn together and I hope you're gonna really like the recipe. Today we're going to talk about grafting tomato plants. We mentioned, uh, we mentioned that in our last segment. Um, I want to start by telling you grafting tomato plants is not easy. So uh, you need to learn how to do it. It takes a little preparation. You got to get your plants planted at the right time. Uh, maybe stagger your, your scion plant um, over a, a week or so there so that you can keep rootstock up, up to the same diameter. It's important that they be the same diameter. These plants I'm using here today are a little bit small. I'd like for them to be just a little bit larger, but uh, this is what we got to work with. So we're just going to go through the basic steps of how you would graft a tomato plant. Now you might ask why would we want to graft a tomato plant? Well, our reason for doing it is that we're looking for disease resistant. Uh, so, so we can get some root stock. Maxifort is one of the ones that uh, shows good disease resistant, adds a little vigor to the plant. Uh, and if we can get good disease resistant from our root stock, then we can grow some of our heirloom tomatoes and not have to worry about all these diseases that they ultimately wind up getting before the season's over. So that is our purpose for doing this, is to uh, come up with a more disease resistant plant. Now in the greenhouse industry, they do it to add vigor to the plant, to increase production. It will do all of those things, but, but for the, from the homeowner standpoint, um, we're just looking at it from a disease resistant standpoint. Um, now I will say before we get started, you can buy tomato plants already grafted and, and you may, some of you may want to try to learn how to do this and some of you may prefer to buy some. They cost about twice as much as your normal tomato plant does, but um, it's uh, for the added ease of growing them. Uh, these uh, root stocks come from, from wild tomatoes. They don't make a, a good eating tomato, so they're just really just vigorous root stocks that, that are not subjected to some of the diseases that we have. So the first thing we'll do here, we've got our root stock in these two pots. I've got these two pots in a little tray here because once we graft these, any watering that we do is going to be bottom watering. So we're going to let the water come up through the pot. We're not going to do any more top watering after we get these plants grafted. Now you will find if you do a little research on this that uh, there's all kind of angles that get talked about. 45 degree angles, 60 degree angles. Uh, there's several different ways that you can do this. W what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to cut these plants off square, similar to what the people do in the Orient. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because as you get older, your eyesight's not as good and I can't match up these little 45 degree angles as well as uh, I would have been several years ago. So I'm just going to cut them off square and we'll just see how they do that way. Uh, you, you can also splice them in several different ways. You can also join them together and, and keep both roots until it, until it heals. But for, for our purposes today, we're just going to cut them off and graft them. So we, we'll use a little clip here that uh, we ordered these from Johnny Seed that, uh, that we'll put them together once we cut them and, and splice them. This is what's going to hold them together. So... Um, with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put one of these clips 
on this plant right here. And I'm going to use this clip to give me my, my angle here to cut this off. So I'm just going to take my razor blade here and I'm going to cut this plant off right here. And this is rootstock, so I'm not worried about that. That gets discarded. Uh, now, I'm going to come over here and do the same thing. I've got my scion here, the, the plant that I want to grow my tomatoes. I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to put this little clamp on here. I'm going to cut this below the cotyledon. And I don't know if the camera can see what we're doing there or not, but I'm going to, I'll move it right up here and I'm going to cut that off squarely just like we did the other piece. Then I'm going to slide my clamp up here about halfway. I'm going to insert the, I'm going to insert this piece into the, turn my pot around here so I can get to it better. I'm going to insert this in that. I'm just going to let them touch together. I'm not going to, I'm not going to force them. They're just going to touch together and that's, that's going to sit there now until it heals. So you can see that the, the, the grafting part of it doesn't require a whole lot of expertise. It's the healing part that's going to take the expertise here when we get, when we get to that here in a minute. Let me go ahead and do this other one while we're doing it. And I'm just going to cut this off right across my, my marker there. I'll go over here to my other my other piece. I'll get below the again below the cotyledon and uh, put my little clamp on there to to guide it and get down just a little bit further. Now, one thing about grafted tomatoes is normally we tell you you can plant a tomato and you can plant it deep, but these cannot be planted any deeper than the, than the graft. If you, if you plant it deeper than the graft, then, then you have defeated the, the whole purpose of, uh, of what we're trying to accomplish here. So we're just gonna push that together right there. Okay, and don't worry about them flopping around cause they do a little bit of that. We might get a little stake here and put in that. So now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna move over here to our homemade healing chamber. What we want to have happen in the healing chamber, we got to keep the humidity up and we got to keep the temperature up. We'd like for it to stay about 78 degrees uh, and we like to have the humidity up there at 85% somewhere in that neighborhood so that these plants can go ahead and heal. And we're also going to put them in a darker area. We don't want a lot of photosynthesis trying to take place here while we're um, uh, trying to heal them up. So I'm, I'm going to move these now over here to our little homemade healing chamber. Now what we've got here is a little heating pad to add, add some, some heat to what we're doing. Like I say, we want to keep the temperature up in the, in the mid 70s. And uh, I'm going to take I've got one of these here that's, that wants to lay over on me a little bit, which is not unusual, but I'm going to put a little piece of, I'm going to put a little piece of bamboo in here just to kind of help keep this one upright while it goes through the healing process. So now what, what we want to do is cover this up. We got to keep the humidity up, but we don't want to put the humidity on the plants. Now this is where the the whole process uh, is made or broken because this temperature and this humidity has got to be right. Too much humidity and, and we lose them. Not enough humidity, we lose them. Too cold, we, we lose them. And we're going to do, like I said before, we're going to do only bottom watering. Now we're not going to put any water on top of them. So what I'm going to do in uh, my little homemade um, thing here is I've got this, uh, I've got this container bottom that I can put over the top. And so what I'm going to do uh, humidity wise is I'm going to spray 
the inside of this. And, and over the next four or five days, I'm gonna keep the humidity high inside of this dome that I'm putting on here. And I'm also gonna keep the plants in a, a darker area so that we're not having a whole lot of, uh, of, of plants trying to grow. We don't want them to be transferring a lot of uh, nutrients. I'm not gonna water them real heavy right now. I don't want a lot of water trying to come up through the root system. I don't want a lot of nutrients coming in from the leaf side. And so this is, this is how we'll keep them. And I'll roll this into a darker place. And, um, and that's what we'll do. And we'll watch them closely, but you, know, you can't ignore them. So you gotta keep the, the temperature and the humidity about right. And then we'll, we'll come back in four or five days and see if we need to start over again or not. It's, don't, don't be surprised if, if you wanna to try to do this, it's a pretty good project, but uh, there is a learning curve that you're gonna to have to go through in order to, to, to be successful. So don't, uh, don't give up if you lose a plant or two while you're trying to learn how to do it. And like I say, there are several other uh, ways that you can go about grafting them than what I did here today. And you can, you can study that and try some of those. And, uh, and when you get good at it, call me and I'll come by your house and get some plants to grow next year. Now my favorite part of the show, we're gonna to go to the kitchen and see what Susan is fixing. talking about corn today and we're going to be putting together baked corn and so we have just it's really a simple recipe it doesn't have a lot of ingredients but it's a really to me a really tasty corn it kind of spunks it up just a little bit with a little zizz to it taste and so um, I hope you're going to like it um, and if you like cheese you'll definitely like it so the first thing we're going to do for the recipe it calls for two eggs so I'm going to go ahead and take those and um, I'm going to um, break the eggs and we're going to um, beat those two eggs. And you don't have to beat them, you know, really hard. This is the main thing is to get them all mixed together. So we're going to go ahead and do that first. So I'll put my two eggs together. And I'm going to whisk those just a little bit. Let me wipe my hands just a little bit. And I am going to whisk right over this big bowl because I'm, in the, I'm going to end up putting them in the big bowl. So I'm just going to whisk those around because I really want them to be mixed up because it'll say two eggs beaten so we're just going to get those all beaten up and those look pretty good so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and dump this in the bowl because that's going to be our first thing we're going to do and on the recipe it's going to tell you to mix the eggs and sour cream now I have used a half one and a half cups of sour cream so you're going to mix the sour cream and the eggs together so we're going to go ahead and do this this is light sour cream if you don't like sour cream, another option would be is cream cheese. You could do this also in the place of the um, sour cream. And I am using the light sour cream, so um, if you want to, you can even try the fat free if you're really trying to watch your weight too. So we're just gonna kinda mix this. And this makes me think of butter. Um, this recipe does not have any butter in it whatsoever. But just mixing this together makes me think of butter uh, mixing into, to, into the sour cream. So we're just going to mix it really well and get it all incorporated together, the sour cream and the eggs. And I'm almost there where I want it to be. By the time I get it mixed up, you won't be able to tell that there's two eggs. But it is going to help it combine together and bind as it keeps it uh, together when we bake it and everything. So we've got our two eggs mixed well in with our sour cream. And that's two eggs and one and a half cups of sour cream. Now the other ingredients we're gonna end up just putting all together. This is two cups of corn. You can use frozen or like I talked about earlier, you could even cut the ears, take the ears of the corn and take the kernels off and have fresh corn. So when that fresh corn's coming in, you need about two cups. So this is about two cups of corn see if I can just use my spoon. Um, so you're gonna put that in with the other mixture of sour cream and eggs. And I'm just gonna keep stacking. 
Now this is my favorite part too, is cheese. Um, this is our, what we call, to me, one of my favorite cheeses. This is Monterey Jack, and it, it's gonna say two cups of Monterey Jack. So, and this is uh, shredded up, Monterey Jack. So, you know, it's not just the, it has a little bit of taste to it, and I like Monterey Jack. And it also melts really well too, and it incorporates really well in this, into the, the corn bake too. So we're gonna put that in, and then also we're going to put just a, change it up a little bit instead of the same old, uh, baked corn, we're gonna add some salsa. Now this, this salsa right here is four ounces, but you could, if you don't like salsa, you could add four ounces of like the green chilies to, get, to give it some color and to, to give it some taste also. So we're gonna put that in there also. And let's see if I can just move these over here. I'll put these eggs in one of these containers. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to stir this up. And the last thing that we have left is some cheddar cheese. Now it only takes a half of a cup of cheddar cheese and the cheddar cheese is gonna go on top. So it's gonna give a little color. But the salsa to me just really adds to the corn. It just um, gives it a different little uh, taste from the regular just plain old baked corn. So if you're having company coming over and you want something different for them to try, this is a really good recipe. It's easy to make. Um, you can make every, put everything together ahead of time and then mix it up right before you get ready to bake so it's ready fresh to go. And so you can see it already looks different from just the regular old corn. Um, it has that little bit of tomato look to it. So we got the salsa that really adds the color to change the color also. So you're going to need to put this in some kind of dish and we're, we're choosing like a, a pie pan or some type of quiche dish or a, uh, like an eight by eight type pan is what you want to do. I always spray a little uh, spray on the pans because I like easy cleanup and anything that's going to come out fast where I don't have to wash as much is better for me. So that's, it's already been sprayed a little bit. So I'm just going to put this casserole together. I'm going to mix it all together and make sure it's in this dish really even because we want it to bake even. And I'm going to, once I get all this in here, I'm going to add the last part of that cheese. I'm going to wipe my hand just a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of push it out, make sure it's all out toward the edge. And as you can see, this is pretty easy to do and it's very tasty and this is going to feed about six people. Really depends on how many serving somebody eats as far as six people goes but um, and you could double this if you have a big crowd you want to double this to uh, feed a big crowd some weekend when you're having a party and you have people coming over um, this this will you can do this double this very easy so what I'm doing now is sprinkling the last part of this on here which is our cheddar cheese on the top and the casserole the baked corn is about to be ready to be done so as you can see I'm going to put this in a 350 oven. We're going to bake this about 35 minutes until you see it bubbly all through. And, and it'll kind of uh, stick together and hold together with those eggs. It binds together really well. So you will see that it will come out looking really, really nice. So we'll see you back in just a little bit on Garden Delights. Frank's going to come in and taste our baked corn. And I hope it's going to be something he'll put on his list for his wife to cook him sometime in the future. So we'll see you back in just a little bit. back to Garden of Lights. We have Frank with us and we're going to be tasting that baked corn and you know Frank talked more about tomatoes today and so I couldn't stand it. I just had to bring some tomatoes back into that little uh, us eating. So Frank you've got a slice of tomatoes to eat also today and you know you can't beat corn and tomatoes when the gardens are coming in, the corn's coming in. You got to put some corn and tomatoes together so to me that's just a perfect combination. So let's try some of this corn I got, bake. I got nothing to say. I just came to eat. All right, let's do that then, Frank. Um, tell me what you think. I'm not going to tell you what's in it. I never tell you what's in it. I always try to get to see what you're going to think about it. So tell me what you think. And it's a little still warm because I see a little bit of heat on it. So if it's too hot, let me know. All right, what you think? It's good. 
As usual, I mean, you know, that's the only reason I come back. Well, as I can see the steam. It is a little warm, isn't it? Don't overdo it. So as you can see, very, very tasty. Stays to wet, uh, together very well. Easy to do. Try this corn bake. Check out our website. Get the recipe. I think it'll be something you want to put in your recipe file at home, and I know everybody's going to like it. We'll see you next time on Garden Delights. I guess I'll have to talk about growing corn now.